Awesome. Cool. I I'm so excited. I love preaching. I love like you know being able to stand up and share what wisdom I have with people. And I really want to commend um, Ben and Shar for leading during the kind of rave session we were having in the first part of worship. Um, it's really hard to lead worship sometimes when there's like about a million other things going on. But I really like commend them for like powering through it uh, and getting there. So. Um, yeah, so as Jason said, we are pressing on with our series on Hungry Hearts. A few weeks ago, if you remembered, Rachel preached, oh, just got really loud there. Rachel preached on David being in a, a pretty imperfect human being. Um, but the reason that he was still referred to as a man after God's own heart was because even in his lowest moments, he ran to God with his mistakes and he had the openness to be led by the Spirit back to God. Uh, Rachel also touched on, and this is something I want to go deeper on to, with today, is that our faith is more valuable to God during our moments of worship and our moments of deep need. Uh, so if you're a note taker, get your note, notebook out, if get your typing fingers ready, because we are going for a ride, I can promise you that. Um, today we are looking at desire. And I promise, and I swear to you, I did my absolute best to try and fit the, the 90s pop hit slash football chant, Freed from Desire, into this talk. You know the one that's like, um, you know, Freed from Desire, you know, Minds and Senses Purified. Do you know that one? For the football fans, you might know it better as Will Griggs on fire, Your Defense is Terrified. Are, are you with me? Yeah? I mean, although it's not, it's not happening, I'm afraid. Although I did very, come very close to naming my talk, um, Preach on Desire, Turn to Psalm 63, Preach on Desire. So, but uh, anyways, let's read some scripture before we get too carried away on a tangent, which is a bit of a running theme for uh, my talks and just any conversation with me, to be honest. Um, so as I said in my little tune, Preach on Desire, Turn to Psalm 63. Fantastic. And it says this, it says... You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, and with singing lips will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Now, I'm sure you know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, you know, that kind of timeless fairy tale of a young girl who breaks into a, f a house of a family of bears, decides that, she, decides that some of their porridge is too hot and then too cold or too salt or too sweet, I can't quite remember, and then decides that the third one's just right. Then she gets in a chair and decides it's too big, and then another chair and it's too big, and the last chair it's just right, and she breaks the chair. Decides to go for a mid-morning nap, because who doesn't love a mid-morning nap? Uh, gets into the bed, tries the first one's too hard, the second one's too soft, and the last one's just right. Then the family of bears come home from their morning walk and they kind of deliver those signature lines of, oh, someone's been eating my porridge, someone's been sitting in my chair, and someone's in my bed. Now, maybe because the people who taught me this story were maybe slightly a bit sadistic, then I wasn't told that Goldilocks got, got woke up, got scared, and jumped out the window and ran away. I was told that she woke up, got scared, and then got eaten by three bears. Um, you know, the obvious moral of the story is, you know, don't steal or be selfish or you might get eaten by a bear. Um, but I believe that there is a deeper moral here and I want to come back to that later. So do remember the story of Goldilocks. And so I have an idea that I want to submit to you this morning and I've kind of called it the three levels of desire. So imagine that you're starting a new amazing show. Imagine after one episode, you are hooked, all right? You cannot get enough of this show. You watch and you watch, and now it's 3 a.m., and you know the kids are going to get up in about two hours, so you go for your nap, and put the next opportunity, bang, you're straight on it, you're watching the show, you can't get enough, you love it. The characters, the story, the plot, it's all just incredible. You are in utter reverence of this show. Now imagine the season that you're on ends and you have to wait six months for the new one, you are close to tears over the fact that you're going to have to wait. You are gutted. Every day for six months, you are thinking about the show. You're, you're counting the days down on your calendar. You almost feel like you need the show. You're in total desperation for more of this show. 
And finally, imagine that all the seasons have passed and you've hit that kind of drop-off point that every kind of TV show has where the creators either get a bit lazy or they change or maybe you've just lost interest. And so you kind of just give up. You know, you might keep watching it just to finish it for a bit of closure, but, you know, you're barely enjoying it anymore. You aren't that bothered if more comes out. You might keep watching. I don't know. You're completely kind of just meh, complacent about the show. And so these three levels of desire, putting them into the context of how we view God, we've got up here, we've got reverence, okay? This is like you're on top of the world with God. Every worship experience leaves you in joy and worship of the King of Heaven. You stroll down the street with what would Jesus do imprinted on your heart. You listen to worship tunes in the car all the time and no amount of road rage will deprive you of your joy ride with Jesus. You take praying like a duck takes to water, and it's the most easy and natural thing in the world. You adore God. A few exaggerated examples, but you know what I mean. Just a total, utter reverence of God. Now, desperation down here, is, it's simple. It often sounds a lot like this. It sounds like, God, I am so broken. I need you. I need you, Father. Please, I do not know what to do. Why does this keep happening to me? Why am I like this? Why am I so sinful? Why is every day so difficult and painful? I just need you. Desperation is where we find ourselves when we get a good long look at ourselves, especially after a recent sin or something quite difficult has happened to us. And in the middle, we have complacency. Another word you might have heard and we've used here before is lukewarm. And the point is, that it's when you kind of get used to God, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, cool, Jesus loves me. Yeah, I go to church on a Sunday. Oh, oh praying, I do that sometimes, yeah. Oh, oh Jesus, oh, he's, he, yeah, he's a mate. Yeah, he's a good friend. And the thing with complacency is that it's the easiest level to get on and the worst level to stay on. And so in the psalm, we see David do this. He's bouncing between complete and utter reverence of God. And, you know, in verse 3, it says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. In verse 4, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Complete reverence of God. And in total desperation on the other side, earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, I cling to you, it says in verse 8. And so both of these things are desire just different expressions of it. One is, God, you are amazing. I see you. I have you. Now I want more. And the other side is, God, I feel so broken. I feel I have nothing. I feel I am nothing, and I need you. Being in the place of utter reverence is seeing God as king above all else. Being in a place of desperation is seeing God as savior above all else. And being in the place of complacency and lukewarmness is just meh. It's nothing special. And in fact, one thing we really rarely see in the Psalms is David in a place of complacency, a place of lukewarm. And I'm not saying that he was never complacent. In fact, I think that's when we're most likely to sin is when we become lukewarm and complacent. But as Rachel said, it's not about our ability to stay in reverence of God, nor is it about allowing ourselves to never move from being desperate. It's our awareness about becoming complacent and lukewarm and how we resist that. And this is a totally biblical idea. I'm not just like pulling this out from thin air. I know it's kind of unlikely coming from me, but I'm not making it up. And nor is this just a nice little self-care tip. In Revelation 3.15, uh, Jesus says this. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, reverence or, or desperation. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you from my mouth. Ugh. And it's going to be hard to hear, but Jesus isn't talking to Pharisees. He isn't talking to God's enemies. Do you know who he's talking to? Us. He's talking to the church. And if that doesn't hit you there, then I don't know what will, because that gets me right there. And so I think desire is a bit like coffee. It's really great hot. It can be pretty good like ice cold. But when it's somewhere in between, it's no good at all. Now, the good news is, for a bit of relief, is that if you're sat there and you feel even like a tiny bit of guilt, that's a great start. That's a good place to be because I know I feel guilt every time I read parts of the scripture like this. But often guilt comes with conviction and conviction is one of the tools that we can use to help us stay vigilant. You see, there is an enemy. There is. And Peter puts it, a prowling lion looking for anyone he can devour. 
And he is much more concerned about the state of your faith and your desire than anything else. And he will do whatever he can to pull you down from reverence or pull you up from desperation into lukewarmness. And why? Why does, why does the enemy want us to lose our desire for God? Why does he want us to lose our faith in God? I'm telling you, it's not just because being spat out of Jesus' mouth it just sounds a bit nasty. Um, a wise woman once taught me that um, our entire identity, who we are and how we perceive and experience the world, fully rests on how we see God. If our view of God is expansive enough that we were always in reverence of him, we would never sin. That's what heaven's going to be like. We're going to be in total reverence of God 24-7. We'll never want to sin because God is everything to us. If our view of God is humble enough that we're so totally aware of our brokenness and need of a savior, we'd never sin again either. But if our view of God is anything less than seeing his majesty or or thinking that we don't need a savior, not only is our faith at risk, but our whole being, our whole identity as well. That's why the enemy wants us complacent. That's why he wants us lukewarm. The devil's number one goal is to attack your view on God. It always has been. Just because if we lose our view on God, we lose ourselves in the process. It often sounds a lot like this. He says things like, oh, God didn't do what you prayed for. Are you sure he loves you? Oh, God didn't heal you or your friend. Are you sure you didn't do something wrong? Oh, you've not heard from God recently. Are you sure he's even real? The moment we lose our desire, reverence or desperation, the enemy sits up and he gets to work. As Dutch uh, Christian writer Corey Ten Boom said, what the devil can't destroy, he'll distract. And so the reason we sin isn't, I want to do a bad thing, so I do the bad thing. It's not that simple. The reason we sin is because we were tempted to. And we were tempted because it came from a desire. That desire came from a lack, and that lack came from not perceiving God as who he says he is and how he truly is. I'll say, I just want to say that again. Sin comes from temptation, which comes from desire, which comes from lack, which comes from a misconception about God. Sin always comes from a misconception about God. It always has. Just look at Adam and Eve. They took a moment where they didn't believe God was who he says he was. And what happened? They sinned. David could so, see, so clearly see God for all his glory and himself for all his humanity that his desires more than often stayed in check. But the moment he took his eyes off of God in all his glory and himself and all his weakness, he sinned. The moment that he, his view of God wasn't God is enough, as you wrote in you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all I need. The moment he stopped believing that, he slept with Bathsheba and he sent her, his uh, husband off to die. His desire changed from reverence and desperation and he became lukewarm and that's when the enemy struck. And after that, he, retur- he returned pretty quickly to desperation. If, if, you, if you have a chance, read Psalm 51 and you'll see how desperate David became after that. So do you remember about four hours ago when I told you the story about Goldilocks um, and the three bears? Well, I think the moral that surpasses simply breaking and entering and stealing is going to lead you to get eaten by a bear I believe the moral is that if we get too comfy, if we get too cozy if, in life, if we become entitled, if we lose our desire and our perspective, it will lead us into major, major problems. And so the moral, moral of this for us is that if we lose desire and become too kind of lukewarm, we run the risk of being eaten by a lion. Not a real one, although it depends what kind of work you're in. Um, if you're, if, I think if you were to interview like a military commander or like a tiger or something like that, I don't know if you'd ever interview a tiger, but if you get the chance, let me know how it goes. Um, but I have a pretty good guess that they would advise that the best time to strike the, at the enemy or strike at a prey is when they've let their guard down and they've taken their eyes off their surroundings and they feel comfortable. So how? Imagine if I just like switched the microphone off and sat down and left, left all that out there. So how do we protect our desire? How do we stop from becoming complacent and lukewarm? How do we keep from being spat from Jesus' mouth? I've got three things to offer in the way of wisdom and advice. And you might want to write these down. You might want to write down all three or just one that stands out. Even if it's just a little note on your phone, I highly recommend that, that, that God speaks to you through something today and just that, that, you, that, we, that we listen, that we, we soften our hearts to listen to this. 
So the first thing is check your temperature. Are you too hot? Are you too cold? Are you a bit lukewarm? The way, the way to tell isn't like out there or anything. It's actually, it's in here. And it's in here as well. You see, the Bible isn't just a, you know, a book of nice, big thoughts. And the Holy Spirit isn't just like cast with a friendly ghost. But they're, they're, a, they're a thermometer for checking the state of our faith and our desire. And as I said before, if you feel even a little bit of guilt, it's a good start. The enemy will want to use that guilt against you. He'll want to turn that into shame. Because we, we believe that guilt is when we know we've done something wrong. But shame is when we feel we are wrong. Just our being is wrong. But God wants to use that conviction to draw him closer to you. And the thing is, we don't do that by just trying harder. If, it, if there's one thing you take from today, don't let it be, I'm just going to try a bit harder to read my Bible or pray. It's about accepting the grace that God has for us for then when we, when we don't read our Bible or don't pray, which we should do, but when we don't do it and we accept the grace that God has for us, we can use that as a platform to be in reverence of him again. The grace that he's given us is such a gift that we can use to praise him So use conviction as a stepping stool to come even closer to your Father in heaven, not as a chain to bind you to shame. Secondly, so we've got check your temperature. Secondly, explore God. It is sadly way too easy to move from reverence to complacency. It's, it's so easy to go from, I'm like having the time of my life with God up here to just being like, eh. And the reason is, I'm sure you've heard the phrase before, before sorry, that um, complacency breeds contempt, Right? You know, that when you get used to something, it just kind of loses its value. That's how, like, shopping works, basically. If you buy a t-shirt for, like, 20 quid, and then you wear it a couple of times and then sell it on, it's going to be worth less than it was before because of the time that's passed. In other words, the more we get used to God, he begins to slide away from being as valuable to us as he was, and it's such a sad reality. But I believe there is a cure for this. Never stop discovering God. Uh, in, in his book, Jeremy Riddle, a, a worship pastor in the States, he said something like this. He said, um, when we worship in spirit and truth, when we worship in that truth part, the more we discover about God, the more there is to worship. I don't know if you've, like, ever, been, if you've ever been in love with somebody and you've met them and like, the more time you've spent with them, you're like, oh my gosh, we have so much in common. Oh my gosh, you're, she's, she's actually really lovely. Or he's actually like, he's actually like, really just generous like you know he's really great with kids or whatever that is the more that we learn about someone the more we're appreciative of who they are and it works the same for God but the thing is with like human beings we'll discover some things that we're maybe not too happy about but with God I can promise you everything that we learn about him will just lead us to more and more appreciation of him so discover more of God lean into his word be sensitive to the amazing things that he's doing in our lives in our church and let's use that to lift high his name and glorify him and stay in reverence. So we've got to check your temperature. We've got to explore God. And lastly, change your perspective. I get the sense that some of us here took a sigh of relief about two weeks ago when Rachel said that it was okay for us to be aware of our brokenness and desperate for God. I know I did. Because sometimes I fall into that trap of thinking that I always have to be on top of the world and, and think God's amazing and great and stuff. Like... You know, I'm a, I'm a worship leader. I'm up there every Sunday. And, if, you know, I, I feel like I've got to come across as this guy who totally understands and totally sees God and has amazing experiences of the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. But the truth is, that doesn't happen a lot. It really doesn't. And often that's more because of my heart than anything else. On any given day, I can bounce between reverence and desperation 40, 50 times and still end up lukewarm at the end of the day. But look again at what, Jesus, what we read about Jesus earlier when he said that he'd rather our desperation, he'd rather our deep need for him than our kind of, eh, just turning up to church on a Sunday is enough or, you know, praying every so often is pretty good. He'd rather us be down there, like, crying out for him and aware of our brokenness than just kind of being like, eh. And so if Rachel Gardner is saying that and Jesus is saying that, then surely there must be something there, right? You know, like if Rachel V. Gardner and Jesus are saying the same thing, it must be sound. Can I get an amen? Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're still with me. So the desperation that we are feeling right now, maybe, for our Father in heaven, the feeling of being so tired and exhausted and broken and full of nothing but sinful thoughts and a sinful heart. Jesus doesn't say, get away from me. I only want the people who are up here in reverence. 
Instead, what he says is, come, be with me. Come to me. Let me help you. And all we need to do is hold on to that hunger and that thirst for him. And when the miracles happen, when the healing happens, when he pulls us out of that desperation and puts us on that mountaintop of reverence, we've got a platform there to then glorify him and find our reverence again. Now, this isn't all just like pointless of like, oh, well, we're just trying to get into reverence so we can get into God's goods book so that we don't go to hell, basically. The point of, of learning more about God, of discovering him, of checking our temperature, of changing our perspective, is not so much more that, yeah, we find more out about God, but we also find out more about ourselves. We learn who we are. We learn who we're made to be. And that comes from desire. So people of God, my church family, let us never lose our desire for God. Whether in reverence or desperation, I know in myself, I'm so much more often in that place of desperation for God than in reverence. I, I know for a fact that's true. Like, so I, even at the time being, um, over the last few years, like, I felt that every year God gives me a word that begins with D that like, you know, describes my season, basically. Um, for a while, it was discipline. For a while, it was um, devotion. Um, at the moment, it's desperation. Sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm on my knees in my bedroom crying or falling asleep crying because I'm just like, God, I need you. I don't, I, I'm nothing, I have nothing, I feel like nothing. And that might be a bit harsh to myself, but I think sometimes when we're really aware of our sin, and we're really aware of how broken the world is around us, we, we just need him. So it's about our desire. We need to get our desire there. So just to quickly summarize, and, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna, the band's gonna come up and, and, and lead like two songs, basically. The first song was just a chance for us to reflect and maybe pray for one another. I would love to pray for you and, and pray with you as well if um, desperation is something you're experiencing now or you feel like you are drifting into that space of just being a bit of a kind of Sunday Christian. Like, let's break out of that as well. Um, but we've got our reverence, we've got our desperation, we've got our lukewarmness. It's so much better to be hot or cold than lukewarm. And the way that we can go about trying to do that is we can check our temperature. We can make sure that we are sitting in a good place in our hearts and our desire. We can explore more of God. There's always more of God to see. Whether it's like something new that you discover in scripture or something new he teaches you or speaks to you about or something old that you remember that he's done for you, we can use that as well. And lastly, we can change our perspective on what desperation looks like. Because I think we beat ourselves up when we're in desperation. We beat ourselves up when we feel incapable, when we feel like we can't do it, when we feel like we need help. But actually realizing that that's, that's an okay place to be. Not a great place to stay. I wouldn't recommend staying there for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, but I, the, the plan is to hopefully getting back up to, to that reverence place. But Jesus still says that it's so much better to be down there and, and thirsting and hungry for God like David was than to be stuck in this place of complacency. Um, 